This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Hal Siegel was founder and president of the Association of Time-Sharing Users and the Association of Small Computer Users and several other groups dedicated to early computer systems. The Association for Time-Sharing Users was formed in 1974. It published a newsletter, which Hal wrote, as well as directories of terminals, applications, database management systems, and so on. Group members held meetings in various cities around the United States. Hal is also author of the books How to Select Your Small Computer Without Frustration and How to Manage Your Small Computer Without Frustration, which were published in 1982 and 1983 by Prentice Hall. This interview took place January 9th, 2018. My background is uh, uh, finance and economics, and I was living in New York City in the, uh, in the early 70s. And I, uh, after I, I got a, uh, uh, after my master's degree uh, emphasizing economics, I got a job with the Hertz Corporation, the rent a car company, which was then a subsidiary of RCA Corporation. Okay. Really? It has since changed, but that was the corporate structure then. And I was their manager of financial analysis, and I was. Uh, doing budgeting. And at the time, the most high-tech way of doing budgeting was to use, ready for this, a spreadsheet. Uh, And at the time, there was this early program called VisiCalc that allowed you to do a spreadsheet and actually change a number, and then all the other numbers on the spreadsheet would change accordingly. And this was high-tech, whiz-bang, phenomenal stuff. And for an accountant not to have to manually recalculate every cell in the spreadsheet was just amazing. So I was one of the early users of uh, uh, spreadsheets, uh, online spreadsheets. And the way to do this at the time this is uh, 1973, 1974, <clears throat> was to either use your company's in-house mainframe, which was one way of doing it, or use the, the latest technology at the time, which was computer time sharing, where you had a modem and you connected it through a phone line and you connected it to someone else's mainframe who had a spreadsheet program like VisiCalc or one of the others. And that's what I started doing. I was, uh, I was developing the techniques to use uh, spreadsheets in, uh, in uh, financial planning and budgeting. And at the time, I formed a little group of people like myself who were researching this in the New York uh, area and trying to decide which timesharing company to use and which modem is best and how to do the speed and so forth. So I, I formed this association called the Association of Timesharing Users. That was the beginning. And because I, I, I uh, didn't mind writing. I wrote the newsletter for this association. And um, we just began gaining subscribers. And um, at the time, this is in 1974, 1975. And at the time, it was taking more and more of my effort. You know, uh, so... uh, I was uh, going to conferences, meeting with other people in the economics field. Uh, the, the big deal at the time was something called econometric uh, forecasting, econometric modeling, which used spreadsheets and computers. And uh, <clears throat> in 1975, I had about um, uh, 300 subscribers 
to the newsletter. We had 300 members of the Association of Timeshare and Users. Mm -hmm. And at the time, my, my first daughter was born uh, in Manhattan. And <clears throat> I said to my wife, gee, uh, maybe if I could get enough subscribers to this newsletter, I could be self-serving uh, and, and self-supporting, uh, rather. And uh, we could move out of New York City. So I set a goal of a thousand subscribers by uh, the end of uh, 75. So in the space of uh, one year, I went, I, I achieved that goal. I went from 300 to a thousand subscribers at the end of 75. Mm -hmm. We charged $30 a year for uh, membership in the association. And at the end of that year, we had $30,000 coming in. I said, gee whiz, that's enough money to actually leave my job at Hertz. And uh, we moved to Colorado. My daughter was one. Uh, as we speak, she's now 41. So that's uh, uh, 40 odd years ago. So um, that was the beginning of uh, the association as an actual independent organization. Cool. The numbers I found for, for what it's worth, um, I found in 1978, it said you had 1,500 members, and I believe at the time you were charging $20 a year at that point. What was... Now, that, um, that was a different... What happened is... Is that when <clears> you combined <throat> with the other group? What happened is we... Uh, I formed... Uh, at one time, we're up to six different organizations. We had the Association of Timesharing Users, the Association of Small Computer Users. That's, that's when uh, in, in uh, uh, the IBM 5100 came out in around 78, which was the first commercial uh, product offering by IBM for small computers. So I started the Association of Small Computer Users. Then I went on to do the Association of MIDI Computer Users. These are small mainframes, large computer users. We had all these different organizations. And at the time, there was a, um, the way people got their information, the way uh, corporate people got their information about any field well, there are these directories of products. This is before anything was online, of course. Sure. sure. And uh, the main company that did these directories of products was called Arbach. And Arbach had these directories of computers and terminals and so forth and so on. And companies would subscribe to this service where every month you get different sheets to stick in your book to keep up to date with all the product offerings. Mm -hmm. Goes up this is this is really going back. They were my competitor before I took over a niche that they had. Yeah. How did uh, you how did you do in uh, taking over there trying to compete with them? I mean, did you move in on their territory in a in a real way? No, I I really I took a niche that they were hardly addressing. That's really how we succeeded. And I had an audience of of these, at that point, 10,000 or so subscribers to my newsletter that um, that wanted information about that little niche, about computer terminals and modems and things like that. So I just, I just carved out a niche that they were hardly addressing. And uh, I don't, I don't remember that they even went to head to head, head to head with me. They, they just let me have my niche and, and then it only lasted, I don't know, eight years or some small amount of time before the whole, the whole thing, uh, dissipated anyway. Sure. And I discovered that they were very out of date. So I decided to have a competing set of directories and that's the, uh, that's where the one came about that you, uh, discovered uh, it was the association's terminal director. The computer terminal director, which has 
like 150 pages of pictures of video display terminals and and printers and and smart terminals and these beautiful pictures of these gorgeous machines that I I just just love looking at them. <laughs> oh wow! Well, you've seen this, and so I edited all this, and this was this was another money making feature for the association that we mm-hmm. were able to sell these directories and compete with Arbach. And we became prominent um, for for computer time sharing people because we were very up to date with all these these terminals are terminals that you. Uh, 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 connect online to mainframes. And then we had another directory, a, a modem directory, because modems were, were uh, getting more and more uh, uh, capable, uh, faster speeds and so forth. <clears throat> and uh, this is a, a very interesting time because it was before small computers became the, the new way of doing spreadsheets. Uh, this was, uh, would, would be, uh, so when, when IBM came, came along with their 5100, then all of a sudden the whole field changed because you didn't have to get online anymore. You could have all, all these spreadsheets on your own computer, which, which was phenomenal because you didn't have security issues. No one else was seeing your data. You weren't connected to anything else. Uh, particularly from a um, a corporate security uh, 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 point of view, your budgeting and all of that, uh, you didn't have a risk anymore of going online uh, to a mainframe that might be owned by somebody else. Sure. It's funny, everything started off in the cloud before it uh, came to personal computers, and now we're pushing everything back off into other people's computers again. You're absolutely right. It's it's very interesting. Uh, people had mainframes. Big companies had mainframes, uh, but they couldn't keep up with all the the software that was being developed for small computers. So, the spreadsheet software uh, just took off. Mm. This this is long before. Um, Long before uh, cloud computing, sure. This, this is way long before the internet. Uh, uh, yeah. So I, I guess I'm. I mean, this is a little bit before my my time. I'm a little ignorant in this. So when what were the services that people were dialing into? I'm aware of CompuServe. I'm aware of the Source and Delphi services. Like, or are we talking uh, services like that, or are we talking? Uh, university mainframes, or, you know, how, where were people di- going to with these terminals? Yeah, all of the above. Yeah, and uh, there was a whole bunch of of uh, upstarts. A person could put a, um, a, a a small MIDI computer uh, 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 in their uh, in their office, and they could become a time sharing service for other uh, users. And so there were literally hundreds of these services popping up around the country um, that were time-sharing operations that you would uh, dial into. And it was very competitive. They would compete with each other for uh, having the best programs online and the, uh, so that you could get into their system. Uh, and I remember uh, here in Boulder, Colorado, I was friends with one fellow who was a kind of a computer whiz, and uh, uh, he he set it up in his office and and he solicited me to to use his system. Cool. So once once you had left Hertz, were you a user of of these systems, or were you mainly in, just in the in the job of cataloging and and uh, spreading the newsletter and that sort of thing? Um. My my personal career path uh, uh, took a few turns. I, I I was writing an awful lot. At one point, I was writing uh, six newsletters. Uh, I wrote for all the uh, computer magazines and computer publications like Computer World and Info World. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wrote um, uh, several books. 
uh, a one called, uh, <laughs> you got one of my books. That's right. The first one before that was how to select your personal computer. And you just held up the second one. How to manage your small computer without frustration. Right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I haven't managed to get the first one yet, but this one's here. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, so, uh, and then I later uh, became a columnist for the Denver Post. Uh, I wrote their computer column every week uh, for many years. And then that column was picked up by uh, seven other newspapers around the country. So I had a little success in that. And then through all this uh, writing in columns, I became a computer consultant. Mm -hmm. So I was helping local companies who wanted to get set up. I'd help them select the system and select the software. And, and uh, sometimes I'd personally help them get started. Nice. It seems like you did a lot of like benchmarks for computer world in my research. I kept finding just just benchmarks of which computer is a little bit faster than the other one. Can you can you talk about talk about that? Oh sure. Oh, that was one of my most fascinating uh, tasks. Uh, a, a, such a, a major question is how fast are the computers in relation to the others? I mean, w which are the best ones? And uh, so what I did is I engaged uh, computer science professors at different universities to actually run benchmarks with standard routines to, and actually test the speed of different computers. And we were the first ones to do this. And it was, um, or for small computers, the first ones, I'm sure it was done by others for mainframes, but for small computers, uh, this this became a, a very important activity, and I wrote uh, I forget how many, maybe maybe ten or more big articles for Computer World, uh, uh, comparing the uh, the computers and giving the results of all these uh, benchmark tests. And then I uh, then I even had some conferences. I supported a conference where people came to Boulder, Colorado, and I rented space at the conference center at the University of Colorado here in Boulder, and and people came and we'd discuss the methodology and we'd discuss the results. And uh, other people that were uh, using the, the systems around the country would, would use this information to help them make uh, good decisions. So in... Uh, when you merged with, in 1979, the Association for Time-Sharing Users merged with the Association of Small Computer Users to form the Association of Computer Users. So was was that all you? I mean, was this the Small Computer yeah. Users also your group? You, you were just folding it all into one? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we had, then we had different pieces. We had like uh, six or so different subsections of that. So, okay, so basically, this was a newsletter, it was a users group with, I think, different uh, meetings in different places around the, the country. Is that right? Right. So how did right. you how'd you coordinate all those from Boulder? Oh, it was easy. It was, uh, I, I had a, a small staff. I think we had reached about 10,000 subscribers uh, 10 years later, like in like in the late 80s, we had about 10,000 subscribers. Uh, so I was, uh, uh, at that time, we, ha we bought a big um, uh, computer typesetting uh, machine. This is before, uh, before the internet and before uh, online. Like a, uh, like, a, like a linotype or? Yes, mm -hmm. it's, it's like a computer linotype. Uh, the linotype was the old uh, uh, pouring lead into and, <laughs> and, and setting type that way. And in the uh, early to mid 80s, uh, big computer uh, uh, machines would, would, would um, it, it was a photographic process. 
So it it uh, what you what it would do is it would project onto a photographic screen the fonts and the uh, and you 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 develop the paper and out would come sheets of uh, of of uh, text and then what you would do is a um, a graphic artist with a light table would take these sheets and cut the strips and then you'd have a waxer and you'd wax the back of these strips of paper mm -hmm. and you'd set it on a form paste up uh, uh, paste up exactly for your newsletter or for your publication and then i'd take that paste up to a printer and the printer would photographic uh, photograph it and 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 uh, turn it into a plate and produce my newsletters like that and that's how all the directories were produced uh, so i had a, a, a staff of uh, paste up people and computer typesetting people and i was generally the author of most of the the stuff wow um all right so tell me something that was it surprised you something that you learned something interesting about as you were running this business and, and doing this for all, for all these years. Tell me a story. Well, the, the major event that came along in the early 90s <clears throat> was the uh, event of uh, the Internet and how people started experimenting with the internet to do what they used to be doing on their uh, their small computers and it became quite a dilemma for for people in the field whether or not to move to the internet for much of the um, processing or to stay with your small computers or in large corporations with your middies or your mainframes. So this became, um, you know, the wild west really. When the internet came along, so many things had to be invented. Uh, uh, security became a, a gigantic issue. You had a lot of forums called listservs. At the time, they were known as listservs, where you can get on and, and uh, converse with other people. And there was a, a, a big a controversy over how commercial the internet should be. And a lot of the local timesharing companies became um, that, that would, they, they were precursors of the internet. They would have their own uh, servers and uh, allowed people, they would host a list serve. And, uh, and it became quite a controversy over how commercial should it be or should it remain more academic and we should be really careful over bandwidth and not, and not, uh, send pictures or whatever that would, uh, would crash the crash the server because it'd be too much they'd be chewing up too much bandwidth and everyone else would slow down on that system uh so this so it's very it's it's quaint right now to think of this how uh if you uh tried to upload or download something big it would affect all the other users on your uh on the on the system you were on yeah, I once in the early '90s, I I single-handedly brought down the the international connection between the United States and and uh, like the UK with by emailing too much stuff to too many people. <laughs> I made some system administrators very mad. It was fun. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um. So tell me about the 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 end of 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 your associations uh, I assume they don't exist anymore tell me about why how and why they ended well 
when the when the internet came along, that was the death of probably between thirty and forty thousand newsletters that were published in the United States. Before the internet, a physical newsletter and magazines were the way that people, business people communicated. Every, every industry had multiple associations. Every association had newsletters. You would subscribe to newsletters and that's how you got your information your competitive information, your industry information. And as soon as people were able to put a newsletter on the internet or email it, that was the death of the publishing business of all these newsletters. And it was delightful for the end user. Uh, the prices came down and then it became free. Virtually everybody was just sharing information and uh, paid newsletters uh, were no longer uh, financially viable. Uh, I had several other businesses at the time that I began to pursue. So I was doing computer consulting and I was, uh, <clears throat> I started a, another business, uh, to insure data for businesses. I called it data security insurance. And I became uh, an insurance man, essentially. I got my insurance license in every state in the union. And I sold this policy, which I wrote, and I got uh, St. Paul Fire and Marine Insurance Company to underwrite. And I had uh, a small computer insurance policy that ensured not only the hardware, but your data, because data was at risk. If your hard drive went down, you'd have to reconstruct from source documents unless you had backups and so forth. So uh, 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 this insurance policy was a, was a success. I had uh, tens of thousands of, of uh, insureds and uh, that became my business, my major business, away from my, my writing and computer consulting. And then later, uh, I, had, uh, I had formed a, a travel agency, and so I started writing a newsletter. This is before the internet in the, in the 80s. I was writing a newsletter uh, called The Resort Report, which I reviewed resorts for my travel. Oh, clients that sounds like a tough gig yeah and that <laughs> also went to the internet uh so and my travel business uh continues to this day so it uh, it had a it, its heyday was in the uh 90s but then uh when the internet came along and people started booking their travel uh uh directly uh and then the the, the airlines did something that killed the travel agency business uh, they stopped paying travel agent commissions uh, to travel agents. And you might remember there used to be a travel agency in every sh strip mall. Yep. Uh, almost every business corner was a travel agency. My dad owned and, one. And, uh, is that right? He lived off that the 10% he got from the, uh, the airlines. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And that did away, when, once the airlines took away their commissions and started soliciting people to book online, that was the end of the travel agency business. As we know it, I survived because my major business was selling resorts uh, and land packages, and uh, I did groups and uh, all that sort of stuff, so I survived. But uh, the business just dissipated much, uh, the, 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 the computer newsletter business dissipated just like the 30 or 40,000 newsletters all across the country on every different field, all of that was decimated by the, by the internet. Sure. So in the early days when the, the home computers were replacing mainframes, did, did you jump on the, the home personal computer bandwagon? And if so, which, what'd you get? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, boy, you're going back in time. <clears throat> I was one of the first ones to, to have, um, let's see, it was the IBM 5100. Then there was a company that was a real upstart, a real go-getter called Vector. Mm -hmm. And they produced a computer that was better than the, the IBM computer. And then Atari and the other uh, computers never really were adapted much for business use. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, there, there must have been at one time 30 or 40 small computers that were vying for attention. All right. What haven't I asked you about uh, the associations and newsletters and, and users groups that, that I should have? Well, you, you've really covered it. I mean, we, we've fulfilled quite an important niche for a couple of decades. But uh, then we were just overwhelmed by events. And most of us in the field happily went on to other things that were more lucrative than publishing a newsletter. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so you said you might have a, a box filled with all the newsletters and everything you ever wrote. Tell me about that. Well, I went looking this morning and I dug up a lot of my old stuff. Uh, I have a number of boxes. Uh, let me, I'll, I'll bring over something. Okay, so I found my two books, the one that you have, How to Manage, and I found my other one, How to Select Your Small Computer. Then I found these three volumes of directories, wow. either the ATSU directories. Uh -huh. And they're called Interactive Computing Directories, Association of Timesharing Users, and The um, tabs are uh, applications directory, company directory, geographic directory, special reports, uh, you know, our newsletters and so forth. So here's a sample of a newsletter. This one is uh, September, October 1979. And uh, this one is all about systems development. And uh, so, for example, here we are. Uh, this is a benchmark test of six popular small computer systems. And so here we have, can you see it? Yes, I can. Uh, yeah. So we have uh, the IBM 5100, which was this one. We have the data point. 1170, the Wang 2200, uh, the DEC PDP 11 V03, uh, the Hewlett Packard System 45. So this is the beginning of business use of small computers. Mm -hmm. Right at the beginning of the whole industry, these are the ones that uh, I identified, so I identified what was out there, then cataloged them, and then benchmarked them. Wow. So that's the first book, the first one, and second one. <clears throat> okay, this one, volume two, the tabs are financial modeling languages, and I have a list of all the financial modeling languages uh, that were available at the time. So I just opened it up at random. Uh, company name ADP Network Services. They Their product name was Financial Modeling Language, or FML. And general descriptions <laughs> of features. FML, okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and so uh, I, I turned the page. The next one is... Boeing Computer Services, uh, their product name is EIS, Information Executive Information Services, 
And the EIS is a financial analysis and forecasting system in which the user interacts with a system conversationally or, or in batch. Nice. <laughs> so the, the tabs here are interactive database systems, interactive statistical packages, interactive graphics, database available to users, databases available to users. So here is a list of all the companies and databases that one can access, interactive accounting systems, engineering programs, specialized applications, and then <clears throat> reports, scientific reports. Man, that must, have, that must have been so much research and writing and work. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Uh, and then volume three. This is this might have been the one you saw because this is impact printing terminals, thermal printing terminals, video display terminals, printers, graphics, remote batch terminals, intelligent terminals, and remote batch services. Yeah, that sounds well. Some of that's familiar. I don't think the book I had had batch services in it, but many of those categories are, are familiar from the so, books. So what I had was a, was a book and it wasn't loose leaf in a binder like that. They might have, uh, see, my service was that I'd send people pages to replace pages or add pages to their books. So that's why it was loose leaf. That's, it was a service to keep them up to date. So I just opened it at random. I could open it to any page and it has... For example, under video display terminals, this the name of the company, their headquarters address, the headquarters contact, all the features of that terminal that uh, that companies could consider. Right. I'm I'm very impressed with what you're doing, and uh, thank you. I feel honored that you are dredging up all this old stuff that I had. I hadn't thought about in decades. You're welcome, and, and thank you. I appreciate your time, and uh, um, this was great. Thanks again. Nice Th talking to you. Thank you. you.